recording, as you know. Okay. Okay. Amber, is this being recorded? Yes. Okay. So the recording will be available for two weeks and then okay. we take it down. Just for anyone who missed the program or came in late or any of those things. Hi, welcome if you just came came in. Um, we're very excited to have this program tonight. Um, this is set up as a webinar. So if you'd like to communicate with the instructor tonight, just go ahead and use your chat box, which is located on the bottom of the screen. I recognize a lot of your names coming up. So I don't think this is your first um, program with us. So I think you all know the drill, but if you have any questions, just go ahead and use that chat box and select all panelists and attendees so we can all see your questions. Joyce, are you able to see the chat box as well? Yeah. Okay, wonderful. Okay, great. So um, why don't we get started? Hold on one second. Okay, good. So um, my name is Joyce Raimondo. It's a pleasure to be teaching this workshop for the Middle Country Public Library. And um, I'm here in my studio in East Hampton, New York. So um, today's theme is sea life animals and um, what we're gonna do in art. And I'm gonna do a slide presentation on PowerPoint and I'll throw out some questions here and there. And you can put your answers or your questions and comments in the chat. Um, Amber, during the presentation, actually, would you be able to read the people's comments? Because I can't see the chat while I'm doing the presentation. Just yes. for that part. Yes, absolutely. If I step away for a moment and there's a delay, then I'll just catch up. Right. Right. And then after the presentation, where we're, I can see the chat. So that's fine. Um, so after this slideshow, then we're going to get started with painting. And basically, you'll need basic painting supplies or drawing supplies, or you are more than welcome, of course, to just observe and, and get ideas. So this is a fun workshop. It's great for the summer. And I'm going to do a little screen share here. And um, I put together this show to stimulate your imagination, okay, and to give you some ideas. So... Uh, let's start with this one. We're talking about sea life here. So um, this goes way back into the mid 1800s. This is fish printing. And this is a Japanese art form where it actually started off for practical reasons where fishermen would record their catch and their accomplishments by actually printing out the fish. So you take a real fish that you caught you roll ink onto it and you press paper against it. That's the most direct method. And then there's other methods that are a little more intricate. So this is really very straightforward. This is one fish on a paper. When you do your painting today, if you want, you could have one creature and that's it, okay? Now this one using the same technique is a little more creative. So what did the artist do here? Um, he put more than one fish, of course. He put an octopus in there. He changed up the colors. You could see he did a black and white print and then he did a rainbow print on top of that on the fish. Okay, so you would never find fish like this in the ocean. So if you want, you can arrange the different sea creatures in a way that's completely unrealistic, okay? This one I love, this is by James Somerville, 1859. This is at the Metropolitan Museum of Art. So let's just take a close look. 
And to help us slow down and really look, I want you to put in the chat what you see here, what see animals, creatures, anything else that you see. And Amber, will you read them out, please? Any responses? We don't have any responses yet. Okay. How about I'll start? I see a fish. I see a seahorse on the upper left. Anybody else? I see what looks like coral on the bottom right. I see a lobster. You see a lobster, Amber, good. Yeah. <laughs> Anybody else? Maybe you don't know the names of these things. Well, I'll tell you what, this was made um, following one of the first excursions in a submarine um, into the ocean. So you can imagine the amazement when they found what's under the sea. And the artist, it's so interesting. On the one hand, it's very detailed and realistic in some ways, right? With light and shadow and detail. Um, but on the other hand, it's completely fictitious because he set up his picture to look like a still life, right? So he arranged it the way you would arrange bottles and, and books and objects like that. So that's something you can think about when you do your picture today. You can have part real. And like I said, you can create a composition that's unreal. You can be very detailed like this, or I'll show you later examples that are more abstract. Now, this is an artist, Guy Harvey. He's a marine painter and he's a commercial artist. He sells prints and t-shirts and things like that and posters. This particular poster he made for SeaWorld to um, raise awareness um, on ecological issues regarding sharks. Now, whether or not you're a fan of SeaWorld and there's many ecological uh, humane society issues that come up with SeaWorld. That's a whole other issue. We're not going to discuss it right now. So, but let's look at this as a painting. Color scheme. What do you notice about the color scheme? And please put it in the chat so I know someone's out there and I'm not just talking to my computer and Amber. So can someone see what, what's the general color scheme here? Okay, we have a super quiet group. We have a small group today. Um, well, I wanted to show this one because- Oh, we, we got a response. Oh, Heather's out there. Heather sees all blue. Yes, it's all different um, shades and tints of blue. And it's a limited palette. So if you want to create a painting today that is a limited palette, you can do that. Now, this is very instructive, this picture, because it's got limited palette, which is all different shades and tints of blue, which I'll show you how to make later. And how did he create depth? How does he make some fish look like they're further away than others, right? The ones that are closer to us are more defined. There's a harder edge around the fish, right? The ones that are further away are sort of veiled by the blue wash of paint. So this is really important when you make any painting. You wanna think about the edges and the definition. Is it a soft edge? Is it a hard edge? And how can you create atmospheric distance? Does that make sense? Also light and shadow. Where is the light coming from in this picture? So somebody answer that one. your observation. Where is the light coming from? Kathy says above. Yes, it's coming from above. And of course, if it's the ocean, it's the sunlight and the deeper into the ocean you go, the darker it's gonna get. So I know that seems obvious, but sometimes when you're making an ocean picture, you might not think about light source. 
But these are really basic ideas. Whenever you make a painting of something that's representational, something that we can actually see, you always need to know where the light source is, okay? Um, this is, a, what's this fish called? I just had a moment. Well, somebody can put it in the chat. It's, it's called exactly what it is, or <laughs> anyway, exactly what it looks like. Um, but this one I showed again. Swordfish. Um, a swordfish, yeah, exactly. Thank, said. You. Thank you. So this is also a very good example of hard edge and uh, a more subtle edge. So if you see those that school of fish, the contrast is more subtle, right? The light blue is different tints of blue and different shades of blue against the background. And then the swordfish, the contrast and the edge is much harsher. So it makes it pop, right? The white is much more contrasting to the blue. So that makes it pop out and come forward. So that's something you wanna think about. The fin is also a very, very defined hard edge. So it gives it more emphasis, right? So when you paint, you don't wanna make every edge, every uh, bit of contrast the same. You wanna generally have variety. So these are just fun pictures I'm showing you to show how you could be playful and creative, okay? So in this one, the artist made a dolphin, it looks like watercolor. And then they played with the paint and the watery effect around the dolphin. So you see some splatting, you see some wet on wet, you see where the artist let the paint drip, you see how the artist made all different cool colors, greens, purples, blues. And sometimes you could even take a toothbrush and you could flick the paint from the toothbrush to get a spray effect or you could take an eyedropper and you could drop paint from the eyedropper if you're working with watercolor. And that's always just a lot of fun to do. This also is done in the same vein, only in this case, this angelfish was masked off, right? So sometimes if you're working in watercolor, you could use glue or you could use tape. You could paint around it and then peel off the mask and you get the fish or whatever image you're, you're creating. Again, hard edge and blended edges. And um, these are different examples. Here you have mostly cool colors and then you have hints of warm colors like yellows and pinks and reds. And this is a good example, even though it's somewhat realistic, it's also simplified. So if you look at the plants on the bottom, the artist didn't show every little detail, he silhouetted the plants and the fish as well. So that's something to think about. This one I like for composition. So composition is how your eye moves around the entire painting and basically how the painting as a whole is arranged. How are the elements arranged on the canvas? So when you look at this one, let your eye follow the different sea creatures around. I want someone to describe what's the movement in this picture. How does your eye move around the picture? How is it composed? How would you describe that? Anybody? then there's no right or wrong answer. How does your eye move from one thing to the other? Kathy says in a circle. Yes, this is a circular composition. So you see the sea otter or seal at the top and that curve leads you to the next otter and then whatever that is in the background, whatever that creature is, and yes, it absolutely goes in a circular direction. And to, so that it's not boring, you have a circle, but then you also have the school of fish that go in a diagonal, right? And I'll show you later how you can have fun composing in that way to create movement. And again, you have a light source. It's coming from the top, the bottom is darker, okay? Uh, this one I'm showing here to show, again, it's monochromatic. Right? It's limited palette. Um, and then the way you could take an octopus, for example, and you could find patterns in nature, 
right? So this becomes more abstract. So sea life is so rich in patterns, like a shell has stripes on it, a shell has spirals. Right here, you have a, a circular pattern. So that's really fun to pull those patterns out. So here are some tropical fish and let's see some interpretations. The, here's photos and here's interpretation, okay? So the artist is becoming more abstract and he's pulling out patterns from the fish instead of painting it realistically. So this is a lot of fun to do as well. Let's skip this one. This one I love, it's somewhat in a naive style, totally unrealistic, the arrangement here, right? Now, how would you describe, I'm just curious, I have no idea what you're gonna say, how would you describe the composition in this one? How does your eye move around this one? Any thoughts on that? How do you move from one thing to the other? Uh, Kathy says busy. Yeah, it's super busy. It's like an all over pattern in some ways. Um, and also unlike the other one, which was very fluid and circular, this one actually the artist laid it at, the fish out somewhat in a grid, right? They're going straight across like a line for the most part and up and down. And of course that's what makes it look completely unrealistic. There's nothing wrong with that. It's actually really fun but it's, it has a more naive quality because of that. Naive is not a bad thing. It's just a way to describe an artwork. This one again, somewhat on a grid, but you see a little more diagonals. Diagonals always suggest something in flux or something moving. This is a very good example of looking at fish, looking at sea life, simplifying it in a way that makes it um, not so daunting, especially for a beginner. This painting is by a very uh, well-known, sophisticated artist, Eunice Golden. And um, she's taking the images of sea life and pushing it to a level where it's so abstract that it almost becomes more of a design and a pattern rather than a painting of the actual fish itself. Does that make sense? So you can do that too. You can pull shapes, you can pull patterns, lines, colors, and then don't even worry about whether or not it looks like fish. This is an example of abstract art that hinges on the edge of representation and abstraction. It's sort of right in between. Okay, done from observation, but is becoming more emphasis into the elements of art. Okay, so we're gonna stop there. Now I want to ask the participants and now I can see the chat. Um, can you please tell me if you have an idea in mind of what you are going to paint tonight? So we have a very small group, we have two participants. So I really would appreciate if you could answer this because this way I'll gear the demonstration accordingly, okay? So can our attendees put in the chat, what do you want to paint tonight? Do you want to paint a, a fish? Do you want to paint a whale, a dolphin? Give me some ideas. Or you don't, maybe you just don't know and that's fine too. Hmm, very quiet group. Okay, I'll give you a moment to answer the question. And in the meantime, I'm gonna get my paints out. Okay, so um, for this project, you are going to need basic paint supplies or you can just draw. So I am working on a um, nice heavyweight Bristol smooth paper. You can work on a canvas, of course, but if you're painting with acrylic or watercolor, you want a decent paper. You don't want computer painting papers too flimsy. Of course, Heather, you're going to need. Heather yeah. is thinking maybe she's going to do a seahorse or a dolphin. Oh, I love it. I love it, Heather. The seahorse is good. There's lots of patterns in that. So I have um, a cup of water here. I have different size brushes. 
This is geared to beginners. Different size brushes are used to paint different size areas, just like you would paint a house. So you really do need different size brushes. You don't wanna paint a large area with a little brush. Um, I'm gonna start off with a pencil eraser and a sharpener just to sketch out my composition. And you need something for a palette. I'm gonna mix paints on this styrofoam plate. I bought these a long time ago. I'm not buying these anymore, but I'm gonna use the ones I have. I'm working with acrylic paint. And so this is what I'm gonna do. I'm gonna lay out my paint on the palette in rainbow order. So I'm gonna start with white. And when you put arrange paint on your palette, don't just put it randomly because the more complicated your painting gets, uh, the more you need to know like quickly exactly where the paint is so you can grab the color um, as you're painting without searching around, like where is that? So I'm not putting out every single color. I'm just gonna put out some basics here. So we have blue, that's a cool color. We have green, also a cool color. That's a viridian green. Um, where's my yellow? Hang on. I didn't put this out in advance because acrylic dries really quickly. So I'm gonna put a reddish orange over there and there's my yellow. And I'm gonna put yellow over here. Now naturally, this when you buy a full set of acrylic paint, you're gonna have two different types of yellow. yellow. That's yellow light, you'll have yellow medium. This is red light, you have red medium, but I'm just keeping this simple. Okay, so I'm gonna put that to the side. And now I'm gonna work up my composition on here. I'm going to do tropical fish, I'm not a realist. And I'm going to demonstrate how you can make a composition. It's helpful for this to have reference. Reference is what you're painting, you know, like a picture of a fish or a dolphin or whatever, rather than do it from your imagination. Now, normally, if I was gonna sketch out this composition, I would do this very lightly, but since we're on Zoom, I'm gonna press a little darker, okay? So, so you can see it. So let's say I might say, well, I'm gonna have one fish here, and this is the line going through the fish. And then I'm gonna have another fish swimming over here. And then I'm gonna have a school of fish going this way, right? And I'm gonna have another fish going here. So I'm gonna have a diagonal this way, and then I'm gonna have a diagonal this way. And then over here, I'm gonna have the water moving this way. And let's see, I'll have some plants. So I'm really, I'm not actually sketching the outlines, I'm sketching the movement and the lines through the objects. Does that make sense? It's like an axis that goes through the fish. So I'm just placing things. You can do this however you want. Okay? But the idea is you wanna create some placement. What's your composition? Is it a spiral? Is it a grid? Okay. I tend to make diagonal compositions. So now I can start to sketch in and you always wanna keep this loose and changeable. That's really important when you make art. Don't get rigid. So here's an outline of a fish and here's some stripes. And here's gonna be another fish. Keep it sketchy. Don't ever get too detailed in one area before you go to the next. Why? What if I did this one little fish right here perfectly and I loved it? And then I made my composition and I discovered, oh, it's in the wrong place. Well, that wouldn't be good if I went into too much detail, right? So you always wanna see the whole and sometimes it's even a good idea to step back and look at it from far away so your eye blends. Now I'm doing this on a table. 
you could also, of course, paint on an easel. So here's going to be some coral. Here's going to be some waves. This is going to be some little swashes of light coming through and waves. And these little lines are going to indicate little fish. And here's going to be another little, little fish. Okay. Okay. All right, I'm gonna call this one topsy-turvy. So, um, yeah, why do artists paint on easels, by the way? Why do artists prop things up like this? Because when you really get more advanced, you're gonna notice when you have something flat like this, this part is further away from me, this part is closer to me. So it's actually creating distortion, it's perspective. And these things are going to appear smaller to me because it's, it's on an angle. When I have it propped up at an easel like this, it's all in front of my eye at the same distance. So that's an intricacy that you'll wanna know about as you get more advanced. But for Zoom, it's easier for me to do this on a table. Now, when you start a painting, you want to cover the whole painting with a wash. Okay, don't do one fish and then the next fish. So what I like to do is I usually use blue, ultramarine blue, and I'm gonna put a wash over it very, very loosely. Now, what is a wash? A wash is when you use a lot of water. If I wasn't on Zoom, I might actually cover this whole thing up with a light, light blue and let it dry. But for the sake of time, I am going to uh, just put some highlights here and there, and I'm not going to cover the entire thing with blue. So what I'm doing is I'm putting a lot of water in my paint. You see that? So it should be very translucent and very, very uh, watery, like a wash. Okay? And I'm using a big brush. I want to keep it really light. I mean loose. Okay. So now I can say, well, let's see. This part's gonna be dark in there. And I'm kind of laying out my darks and light. So it'll be dark behind this plant here. And maybe over here. Let's see where my movement is. And then here. Gonna get lighter as I go towards the top. So I'm kind of giving myself an idea of where the darks and lights are gonna go. And keeping it, like I said, keeping it very, very loose. So that's gonna be the edge of the fish there, the tail. Okay, that's gonna be behind the plant. This is gonna be this fish. back of the fish here. And maybe I'll have this piece of plant life here is gonna be like a dark blue. Whereas this one, it's gonna be light with the darkness behind it. So sometimes I like to play with that. And these are gonna be little fish coming along here. And of course, I hope that if you're working at home, you start working on your picture as I do this. So we're sort of working alongside each other. Okay, so here I'm kind of laying out my composition a little bit. I'm putting wash the wash on the painting, okay? And now I can start to lay in some color, okay? now. This is upside down to you, I realize that. 
And for some workshops, I work upside down, but this one I think is a little hard for me to do that. And please um, ask any questions in the chat, okay? Okay, so now I'm gonna start to lay in some color. And I'm going to do this in a very translucent manner. So this fish will go from orange to yellow. This one will be yellow. Maybe there'll be some yellow coming in here for the sunlight. Maybe this plant will be a little yellow. Now, when you work, you can change the colors of things. Think about Matisse, the great colorist, right? He painted sea life, he painted nature. And he, at the beginning, him and other artists were called fog painters, which is French for wild beasts because their colors was so bright and so wild. And sometimes you can put colors that maybe aren't even really there, like some greens and purples and so on. Okay. So here is the beginning of my composition, okay? And I realize it's showing up very faded on Zoom. So I have this movement going diagonal here, and then these are gonna be two fish going this way. And the whole thing is going to sort of be a little, like I said, topsy-turvy, okay? Yeah, that's really pretty. Oh, thank you, Amber. Um, does any of the attendees, do any of the attendees have questions, ideas, or feedback? Does this make sense? Is there something you want to specifically learn? Because I'm here for you and everyone is individual. So any questions, ideas, or comments? Okay. I'll give, I'll wait a second and then I'll continue. Let's see, I can see the chat now. What, ah, uh, oh, Kathy says it's really interesting how you do that. Well, composition is really fun, Kathy. And, you know, artists have different ways, obviously, of composing, and it depends on your sensibility. I tend to put a lot of rhythm and a lot of activity in my paintings, which you can see behind me, and I'll show you later. I'm definitely not a minimalist. I'm not a person who puts like one thing. Um, but some people really like simplicity or order and they like, you know, everybody, sometimes people have an innate way of arranging things. So you wanna do it your own way. But the idea is think about composition to compose parts to the whole, okay? So now, I am going to start to lay in some paint here and make it more opaque because I'm working with acrylic and it's okay to leave some of the paint translucent and some opaque, not see-through. So you can play with those ideas. I tend to build up paint so that it becomes more opaque. But for the sake of this, let me show you how I can add more detail in here. So, 
again, don't get stuck on one thing. Just because I'm in, don't get too stuck in one area. So right here on this fish, I'm gonna do a gradation, which is going gradually from one color to the other. And I'm gonna go from red, orange to yellow, which of course those colors are next to each other on the color wheel, right? So here, I'm gonna add, put a little more detail in here. And sometimes with acrylic, especially if you're working on a canvas, it really takes a lot of time to build up that surface. Now this is paper. So far I'm using the paint pretty watery, but I'm, I'm adding a little more pigment now. Now I'm gonna add in some yellow. I'm mixing it on my palette here to make orange. And I'm gonna just put it side by side. It's up to you if you want the brush strokes to show through, right? Or do you wanna eliminate them and smooth over them? There's no right or wrong. So you see how we have some nice blending going on there, right? And that's called a gradation. Now let's say if you wanted to eliminate the brush strokes and you want it to be super smooth, you can use, where's my fan brush? Where did it go? You can use this little guy here. This is called a fan brush. And this is already pretty smooth, but you can imagine if you had a lot of brush strokes, you very gently go over it with a dry brush and you could eliminate the brush strokes. There's no right or wrong way to do it. Brush strokes are really good. They're very expressive. And it's a beautiful thing to be able to see the brush strokes like Van Gogh. Okay, so now let's see. I'm gonna think about where else do I wanna put um, my yellow? And I'm gonna get a lighter yellow here, mixing it with white. Now, had I painted these pencil marks, you know, not so dark, you wouldn't see them obviously. But sometimes when I make my acrylic painting, if I could see the pencil marks and the color I'm painting over, it just doesn't cover it up. What I do is I sometimes uh, go over the pencil marks with a very thick white. I let it dry and then I go back into it. So I clean it up a little bit. But I tend to paint, uh, as I'm finishing the painting, I get very neat actually. Not everybody's like that, obviously. Okay, so you can see how I'm starting to build up the color a little bit. Now, let's have some fun mixing different types of blues since we're working with underwater paintings. Now, I'm gonna show you a little chart here because this is a quick color mixing lesson. Okay, and then I'll demonstrate for you. Here's a basic blue right out of the tube. So what did I do here to make the blue lighter? One way is you can make different shades by adding white. And that's what I did going up this way, right? Now to make blue darker, you can add black. And that's what I did this way. But generally speaking, in contemporary modern art, artists don't use black right out of the tube because black is the absence of light, right? It absorbs all the light, no light reflects from it. So it will make your painting look dead. So instead what you can do is you can use your blue and to make it darker, you can make it into a more purplish color by adding red. To make it lighter, you could also add yellow, which eventually it will become green. 
But let me show you what I mean. There's a basic color mixing here. So, and this is really fun to experiment with. I like to do this sometimes separate from my painting. So here's, here's my paper here. So let me, let me freshen this up. Now, by the way, what I just said, does anybody have any questions so far? Okay, so I'm gonna wash off this brush, dry it off a little bit. And now I'm gonna start with blue, right? That's right out of the tube. Now, when you're working with watercolor, you make the color lighter by adding more water. Um, you could do that with acrylic too, um, but with acrylic, you can also make the color lighter by adding more white. And I'm gonna do it very, very gradually. That's called a gradation. So I'm just gonna take a touch of white and put it in there, right? And then I'm gonna put a little more white, see? Oh, that was a big jump actually. Okay, and now I have different shades of blue, okay? Now I could also, like I said, blue is a cool color, so I can make it warmer by adding a little yellow, which of course is eventually gonna turn it into green. So here's my blue. And I'm gonna take a touch of yellow in there And now I have a warmer blue, which turns to green, okay? You could do the same thing with red, like I said, making purple and so on. Now, any questions so far? Now let's see, how does this apply to our painting over here? And then I'm gonna give you a more advanced color lesson. This is like a crash course. So here's my painting. And let's say over here, I want darker blue here, and then I want it gradually to get lighter. So I can apply that technique I just showed you, right? So here's, say a darker blue. And now I'm gonna add a little white. So I'm making different shades, right? Now, 
You notice over here, that was the fish's tail, which now is not visible. Why can't you see it? It's because there's no contrast. So sometimes you have to be aware of that, that in order for you to see the object, you need edges. So just gonna put a dark, dark here on this tail. Now, suppose I say, well, that's not dark enough. It's not really showing up. And I don't wanna use black. I'm gonna show you how I can make a really dark, dark blue. So watch this. Colin, this is another color mixing lesson. If you want to make a dark, dark blue that's almost black, you can use three colors. Blue. Green. And red or a purplish red like in a Linzer and Crimson. Now that turned it brown. So I'm going to put a little more blue in there and a little more green. And you can see how dark that color is, right? And I did not use black. You see how dark that is? So now let's say I wanted to go back into this. and add that contrast, okay? And now you can see the fish's tail. Maybe I wanna make this part also pop. Questions? Am I going too fast, too slow? I think you're moving at a good speed. Okay. I enjoyed the color mixing lesson. So thank you for that. Oh, thanks, Amber. Well, the idea is really when you're painting sea life or you're painting anything, you're gonna need the same set of basic skills, right? So color mixing, painting is all about color, okay? So there you go. Now, let's get a little more advanced. Basic color mixing is adding white or making a color cool or warm by adding yellow or purple and making purple with red and so on. But what if you wanna make your fish not so bright? Because we don't live in the tropics up here. So North America, we don't have fish that are super bright. What if you want like on a dolphin or a whale, you want it to be a grayish blue? How do you make blue gray? Anybody know? Not gray, but grayer, more dull. Okay, well, let's try this. I'm gonna show you a color wheel. And this is really helpful if you're a beginner to understand this. And if you get confused, you could look this up online and you can look up the color wheel. So if you want to make a color duller, you add the opposite color. So here we have the primary, red, blue, and yellow. You mix red and yellow, you get orange. Red and blue make purple and blue and yellow make green. So if you wanna make a color not so bright, you go directly across the color wheel and add the opposite to it. So orange and blue are opposite colors, red and green and purple and yellow. Now, by the way, if you put these colors next to each other, they vibrate like Christmas colors, like red and green, they look super bright right? But if you mix them into each other, they make the, it becomes more gray or brownish even. So let me show you what I mean. So let's say I want to make a duller blue. Hey, 
And by the way, um, when you mix your colors, typically you would use a palette knife, but I'm using a brush because it's a little quicker. This is a palette knife. You can mix your colors with this. So let's see. So, boom. Okay, there's my blue right out of the tube. So, okay, there's my beautiful ultramarine blue. Okay, but let's say I don't want it that bright. I am going to take a touch of this, well, red. It's a red orange. So, because there's a, this is orangey, it's going to make the blue look very dull. See how it became gray? Now, now look how dull it is. Now you'll be able to see it even more if I add white to this. It's a beautiful, beautiful, cool gray. Look at this. Isn't that pretty? So I have it's a nice, cool gray. See? And you can get endless variety of color that way. Now, it's fun to just experiment and play. So on a piece of paper separate from your painting, you can just say, how many different types of blues can I mix? So you could say, well, now I have this grayish blue, for example. What happens if I add a little more green? Wow, look at that. That's a beautiful color too. Oh, that's just like almost, oh, that's pretty. I would put that in my bathroom, right? What if I even add a little more green? Oh, that's nice too, see? What if I add a little more blue? Okay. So um, painting sea life is actually a good excuse to mix different colors. So let's see how I could apply that to my painting now. So maybe this nice grayish blue. Add it over here. Okay, any questions, ideas, thoughts? Okay, I'll tell you what, Amber, are you available to perhaps um, somebody wants to show if they're working on something, you could give them access to put their camera on? Sure, if anyone wants to do that, I could certainly um, promote them to a panelist and they could show off their work. So if anyone would like to participate in that opportunity, just go ahead and put that in the chat box and I will take care of it. And I would really encourage you if you're painting to do that because you do have a teacher available now and um, why not take advantage of it and get some feedback or just show us so we can have the pleasure of looking at it too. So. Well, you can decide. We have a few more minutes. Um, or you could also describe what you're working on. You can put that in the chat if you'd like, okay? 
In the meantime, what I'm going to do is I'm going to continue to work on this painting so you can see how I start to work it up a little bit. Okay. Now, a couple of words about this painting. You might be saying, oh, it looks like a mess. Well, that's how a painting should look at the beginning. Okay? Should look like a mess, meaning it should be loose. Okay? And there's so many lessons, life lessons to learn when you paint. Uh, what do I mean by that? As you paint, try as best you can um, not to focus on the end product, but to focus on the process and noticing like what, what am I doing as I'm painting in the moment? So, Oh, what happens if I put this dark in here? Okay. What happens if I blend colors or I don't? What happens if I mix colors? Those kind of things. Don't project, is this coming out good? What do I need to do to finish this painting? Those sorts of thoughts are not gonna help your painting. And usually, a good teacher can actually tell the moment you started thinking like that because your painting becomes more, less alive as soon as you start thinking too much about the end. Also, don't be afraid to play like a child. Right? Picasso said he spent his whole life trying to paint like a child. Joyce, Kathy did have a comment. I don't know if you saw it. But, um, Go ahead, Kathy. She yes. said you can see the flow of the water as you keep adding different colors. Oh, that's good. That's good. Now here I put a little red. I didn't want that. No, I'm, I'm, yeah, that's good. You know, whenever I do this, I'm not going to lie. I'm like, oh, I hope it comes out pretty good for the students so they could see something fun. Um, but it does take a while to make a painting. So let's see. Now this fish, this is the back and that's sort of, I can't see it right now. So I'm going to get a different kind of green and I'm going to paint that fish green so it can pop a little bit. So let's see what I have here. This is a light green permanent. So it's a little brighter than that other uh, viridian type green. I'm gonna see what I could do with that. Generally speaking, I don't use the color straight out of the tube, right? I need to mix it a little and create some variety. Now, a word about brush strokes. When you paint, even if you're gonna paint realistically and smooth over the brush strokes, the brush strokes are not random. The brush strokes, you could either go in the direction of the object, like I'm doing here on this fish. You could also do the direction, the brush strokes in the other direction if you wanna create volume, right? So, long ways and then around the fish that way. Um, so you don't wanna just sort of put brush strokes down that mean nothing, right? So I'm sort of putting these down to show a pattern with the flow of water over here also.
All right, so let's see how this is so far. Oh, eight o'clock. Okay, so there's the start of my underwater painting. Okay, so my composition tends to be very full, very, there's a lot of movement, okay? I love dancing, I love pattern, I love rhythm. So I think that's how I tend to interpret things. Um, oh, and Kathy says, happy fish. This is super fun to do. It just takes your mind off of everything. You know, it's just, it's a, generally speaking, it's, and Amber says so happy, it's a pleasant subject, but you can also, of course, you know, paint sharks and things like that and make it really intense. And, you know, you could go that way too. So anyway, everybody, I hope you enjoyed this lesson. And I want to thank the Middle Country Public Library for providing these programs and inviting me to um, teach this workshop. And I hope it inspires you to want to learn more. So, of course, there's many books at the library and, um, you know, different art books you can take out to advance your skills as well. So, Amber, thank you so much. And thank you. That's, thank this you was much. great. Thank you so much. So, thank you, everybody. Bye, everybody. Have a good night. Uh, thanks, Heather and um, our other participant, Kathy. Uh, I hope